Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Um, we're going to start Chapter 5 tonight, How It Works. And it's the first time we're actually introduced to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 Steps. But it took quite a bit of work to get it there. I thought we might go over a little bit of the history of how the book came about and how it got to this point and the struggles that went through with getting it to this point. So, as we read the first four chapters, we read Bill's story, The Doctor's Opinion, we read We Agnostics, uh, we read that There Is a Solution, more about alcoholism. Those chapters. And um, it started out with Bill getting sober in December of 1934. So, that was the first time that someone came to hit Bill and said to him, why don't you quit drinking? And he, he worked on a situation and he got sober. We're going to do a little bit of the history. So Bill got sober December 11th, 1934. They didn't have steps. They didn't have a book. They didn't have anything. He was connected with a few people and those few people helped them out. Ebby Thatcher came and talked to him. Ebby Thatcher is a member of a group called the Oxford Group, which is a first century Christian group. And they help people get sober. But that wasn't their primary purpose. That was just something that happened. So Bill got sober. And he realized by talking to Evie Thatcher and other people that the way to stay sober was to help other alcoholics get sober. And so he Bill worked with a lot of people, tried to get a lot of people sober, failed miserably for six months. And after six months, he found Dr. Bob Smith out in Akron, Ohio. And Bob got sober on June 10th, 1935. That's what we now call Founders Day, is when mm -hmm. Bill and Bob were both sober. And so that was six months from December 11th to June 10th was six months that it took Bill to get the next person mm -hmm. sober. And they stayed sober for a while and went on about their business and helped other alcoholics and went to the hospital and talked to the doctor and tried to talk to other alcoholics until they found Bill Dodson and they got Bill Dodson sober. And so that was AA number three. And we suggest that you read that story in the back of the book. It's the title of the story is AA number three. And it's a great story. So. Now we have two guys sober, Bill and Bob, and they started, they decided after they got a few more people, they decided to write a book that was going to help them support what their movement was, their new society of people, it was going to help them support it with a new book, and they're going to carry the message and be able to, to, to help other people, more people get sober. So as they went along, they got up to 100 people sober. Bill's story is chapter one, and he wrote that in late May of 1938. Okay, it's when he wrote the first chapter of the book, May of 38. And then he wrote, There is a Solution, which is chapter two, he wrote that in June of 1938. Okay, so that was early. So they did some more work. You know, they tried to figure out what they were doing. And you got to remember, at this time, Bill had met Dr. Bob in Akron, Ohio. In Akron, Ohio, there was a big presence of the Oxford group. And so... In that area, there was a lot of people that the Oxford group was a Christian group. So the people that went there were Christians. But there was also a lot of drunks there in Ohio that were um, agnostics or atheists. And Bill was pretty close to an ag agnostic. Dr. Bob was religious. So they were having a little bit of a controversy between whether, you know, since the solution that Bill found was to find a, a, a a power greater than himself, a God of his own understanding, and that there was God was in part of the solution, talking to the Christians in Ohio was not a difficult thing. They accepted and understood, but 
half of the first 100, about half of them, were agnostic. So talking to them about God became quite an issue. And the guy that was actually the kind of the managing editor, you know, in charge of helping with the book was a stone cold atheist, did not believe in God, didn't want God in the book. He wanted no religion in a book. So did a lot of other people not want religion in a book. But Bill realized that what got him sober was his spiritual experience he had in the hospital in December of 38. When he had that spiritual experience, he realized that having God in your life and having a power greater than yourself was a major part of getting sober. So he couldn't leave it out. So they went on writing other chapters of the book. He wrote more about alcoholism, we agnostics. Uh, that we just got done with last week. Uh, they wrote that in September of 1938. And then working with others, which is the seventh chapter of the book, was written in November of 1938. To the Wives was written in November of 1938. The Family Afterward and Two Employers were written in 1938, in November of 1938. But the chapters we're going to read tonight, and also A Vision for You was written in November of 1938. But Bill didn't write the 12 steps, and he wrote them separately from any chapter. He just wrote them one night. That was in December of 1938. So there's almost the last thing written. And then How It Works and Into Action, the, the, the two chapters that hold 11 of the steps was written in December of 1938. And then with that, the book was finished and it was sent to the editor and it was published in April of 1939. So it was quite a few years. It was a good four years and three months from when Bill got sober to when the book was published. So could you imagine writing the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in your third year of recovery? I can't even imagine that. Like, Bill had to be inspired to write such a book with only three years of sobriety and with no guidance from before. So they had quite a bit of trouble, as I said, with the, um, with the Oxford group. And the Oxford group had some pretty different ideas about how things should go. They had what they called the four absolutes, you can see on the screen. They were absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute unselfishness, and absolute love which to the alcoholics that they were helping seemed absolutely impossible to be absolute about anything. But it turns out that honesty was, is it true or is it false? A simple question. Purity was, is it right or is it wrong? And how many of us can, it's easily decided whether something's right or wrong. We know before we do something, whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing to do, in most cases, if we're honest and if we think about it. So it's a simple question. Is it right or is it wrong? Unselfishness, absolute unselfishness. The question with being unselfish is, how will this affect another fellow? always considering others before we do anything. And then love, absolute love. Is it ugly or beautiful? And they were tenants that were very hard to follow. It was tough. And then they had six steps also. Uh, and those steps kind of varied a little bit. So Bill had in his mind the steps that were told to him by Abby Thatcher. And they, there were six of them. And they said, step one was, we admitted that we were licked and that we were powerless over alcohol. Step two was made a moral inventory of our defects or sins. Step three, we confessed or shared our shortcomings with another person in confidence. Step four was we made restitution to all those we had harmed by our drinking. Step five was we tried to help other alcoholics with no thought of reward or money or pre pre uh, prestige. And step six was we prayed to whatever God 
we thought there was for power to practice these precepts. So very stripped down, not very well explained steps that were hard to do in conjunction with the four absolutes, which are already tough. So to say that not that many people got sober and stayed sober was easy to see why. So Bill decided to write the 12 steps and he wrote them a couple of times. He wrote, he started writing them and he was tending to write each step of just a simple sentence or two. And he started out with step one and it became 97 words. That's a long step one. And that included all kinds of stuff. And he said, whoops, I better do a rewrite on that. He wrote them again and they didn't come out. And then he was just contemplating it. And all of a sudden one day he gets up and he writes the 12 steps at one time in one sitting, he wrote the 12 steps and they were very close to the steps that we know today. Step one says, we admit you are powerless over alcohol that your life has become unmanageable. Step two, come to believe that God could restore you to sanity. Step three was surrender your will and your life over to the care and direction of God. Step four was made a searching and fearless moral inventory of yourself. Step five, admit to God, to yourself and to another human being the exact nature of your wrongs. Step six, be entirely willing for God to remove all your defects of character. Seven, humbly, on your knees, ask God to remove your shortcomings, holding back nothing. Step eight was, make a list of all persons you have harmed and become willing to make a complete amends to them all. Nine, make direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Step 10, continue to take personal inventory, and when you are wrong, promptly admit it. Step 11, seek through prayer and meditation to improve your contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for you and the power to carry that out. And step 12, having had a spiritual experience as a result of this course of action, try to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics, and to practice these principles in all your affairs. So similar but different. And then became, then started the editing process where the agnostic said, say less about God. And the Christian said, oh no, please say more. And the battle ensued and they fought until Bill said, look, either give me permission to write this book and finish it the way I want to, or I'll gladly turn it over to you and you can write anything you want and I'll step down, I'll step out. And they wanted to write it so it didn't have much God in it, but they actually didn't want to write the book. So they kept Bill on and let Bill do his own editing and put the stuff, they took stuff out, he put it right back in because he was sure that the spiritual angle of the program was critically important to people getting sober and staying sober and that the rest of the things that were in the Oxford group were a little strong. So he wanted to do something a little less strong, but yet he wanted not to have six steps because six steps, the six steps that the Oxford group used allowed too many loopholes where some alcoholic could figure a way to talk, talk himself out of following the steps without actually not following the steps. There was a lot of gaps in the program. So Bill wanted to make it more concise. He didn't know he's going to write 12 steps, but when he got done and put the numbers in front of him, he found out there's 12 steps. So now we have 12 steps with very little wiggle room. We don't have much wiggle room in the 12 steps. If you're going to do the steps, if you do each step the way it's supposed to be done, you most likely will stay sober. It's a very good chance of that. So these two chapters, the next two chapters we're going to read were the last two chapters written, and they're the chapters that con contain the whole program of recovery. And we read these 
you know, we read most of this, you know, we read one part of this every week in our meetings, every day in our meetings, how it works, chapter five. We read the beginning of that and we read it so much that, you know, I know I've caught myself doing it too, where, you know, I have it almost memorized and I can be doing a thousand other things and just read the thing and it comes right out and it's easy and I don't really hear what I'm saying because I've read it so many times over the years. So we're going to take a slow version of it. We're going to look into it very slowly and see exactly what it says and see where the program starts really falling together here. And it really gives you a lot of instructions here on how to do the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it starts out first with a, a very strong paragraph. It says on page 58, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those too who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. So, in our step one, which says, we admitted we are powerless over alcohol and that our life had become unmanageable. The principle behind that step is honesty. And this chapter starts out repeating the word honesty over and over and over again in just this one paragraph. So it's critical to be honest with yourself. And it says specifically that the people who fail are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. It doesn't matter if you're not honest with me. It's not going to change my life. If you're not honest with me, this program how you are in your program is not going to get me sober or keep me sober. It's going to get you sober or keep you sober. So it's, you've got to be honest with yourself. You don't have to be honest with your sponsor. You don't have to be honest with anything you say or do as long as you're honest with yourself. It also says that those who do not recover, people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. So you got to completely give yourself to the program, not partially, not on a part-time basis, not once in a while. If you want to get sober and stay sober, you have to give your whole self to this program. No holding back, no withholding nothing, no nothing, but giving your whole self to the program. And if you're not completely honest with yourself and you don't give yourself completely to the program, you know, there's a good chance you won't stay sober. So it's, it's important. And it goes on to say, even those that have mental problems, people that are not right in the head can get sober if they have the capacity to be honest with themselves. They can be as nuts as they want to be, but if they can be honest, they can recover. And the first sentence alone says anyone can get sober if they thoroughly follow the program. Thoroughly, completely, without fail, follow the program. The program is designed to get you sober. It's not a la carte. You can't pick, I'll do steps one and two, but I don't know about that step three. I'm not going to do step three. And yeah, I'll give four a shot, but that's step five. I'm not doing that. You can't do the program like that. It's 12 steps. Do all 12 in order. And that's the only way we can really have this program work in our lives to keep us sober. Next paragraph, it says, Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. So, the first instruction to you is to take 
the steps. When it says take certain steps, it means the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. At some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. So that brings in the uh, one of the other essentials of recovery is open-mindedness. As we go through this program and we learn these steps and learn what the steps are asking for and learn what we're supposed to do and listen to what other people did, we'll find out that they were thorough and honest with themselves, that they did everything they were supposed to do, that it actually... We were looking for an easier, softer way. When I came into AA, I wanted the guy with the magic wand. I wanted to meet that guy. I wanted him to tap me on the head and say, okay, you're sober. You know, I wanted to do it as easy as possible. And then I've watched other people through the years that tried other ways, tried to do it by sitting in the back row of an AA meeting, sneaking in at 5.30, leaving at 6.30, not talking to anybody not getting involved, and next thing you know, they're missing from the back row because that's not the way to do it either. So it says we have to let go absolutely. All the old ideas we have, the idea that, well, you know, I'll, I'll go six months without a drink and then I'll be able to drink again. That's an old idea. That's an old idea that you've proven over and over again that doesn't work. So we've got to get rid of that idea. The delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. We're alcoholics. We're not normal people. We are abnormal. And we have to get rid of, we're abnormal because we have a disease and that disease needs treatment. And the treatment is these rooms, these people, this book, and a loving God in our lives, active in our lives. That's what the solution is. And that's the solution we have to take. That's the treatment. We have to take every day is to treat the alcoholism. Untreated alcoholism is a very ugly thing. It kills people. Sometimes the treatment of alcoholism is a pain in the butt. Going to a meeting every day and doing all this stuff. I mean, it really is a pain in the ass sometimes. But it's the only way we get sober and stay sober. So we have to do it. And this is, in fact, the easiest, softest way that you can do it in the end. Because all those other things, those threadbare ideas that you'll be able to drink, you'll be able to change what you drink, you'll be able to change where you drink, you'll be able to, you know, all that stuff has never worked, never will work. And that's the end of that. And then next it says, remember that we deal with alcohol. Cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one, capital letter, who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. And earlier in this book, in the chapter we agnostic, it says, the main purpose of this book is to help you find a power greater than yourself that can solve your alcohol problem. So now the book is saying, Please, I hope you find God now. And then it says, half measures availed us nothing. We stood at a turning point. So what's that turning point? That turning point is, am I going to quit drinking and live or am I going to keep drinking and die? Now, you may not be on your deathbed yet, but you're, if your life has fallen apart, if you can't keep a job, your family is coming apart at the seams, if everything seems to be going wrong, if you continue drinking, it's not going to get better. It never gets better. So the turning point is either stop drinking now and do follow the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous or go on to the bitter end. And it's not a good, it's not a good result. And you may think you're not there yet. You may think that it's not going to happen to me. I said that too. Uh, but it happened to me. It eventually happened to me. It took a long time. 
but I could have saved many, many years if I would have just allowed myself to think straight for one moment and find a solution and admit that, you know, be honest with myself. If I would have been honest with myself 20 years before I came into AA, it would have saved me 20 years of misery, but I couldn't get honest with myself. So now the book is asking you, begging you to be honest with yourself. So it's time to be honest with yourself. It says, and this is a, this is a, a prayer that sneaks in here that nobody, I didn't recognize for years and years and years. It says, we asked his protection and care with complete abandon. That is a critical prayer in our recovery because you're just making the decision. You're just deciding that, you know, you just told yourself, you know, I'm an alcoholic. My life is unmanageable. You just said, I need help from a power greater than myself. So you're right there. You're right in a place, but it's scary because you're going to have to do a lot of changing. You're going to be honest with yourself. You're going to give up your old ideas. You're going to become open-minded and it's scary. So we ask his protection and care with complete abandon and he helps us so that rough road that we're getting ready to go through will not be so rough after all. And it says, now, here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. So we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. And that's, there's no work to that step. You don't have to do anything. You can do that step sitting in a chair. You don't have to write anything down. You don't have to do a damn thing. You just have to admit something to yourself. There's nothing to it. There's no work there. Step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So how do you work step two? You don't, there's nothing to do. Come to believe. Come to believe is not an action. It's not a thing to do. It's a thing that happens in your head. When you're being honest with yourself, you can come to believe in something. You've come to believe in all the stuff you've believed all your life. Now you have a new thing to come to believe in. So there's no work to be done. Again, no writing, no nothing. All you have to do is come to believe. And you take a little tiny bite of that. You don't have to start going to church every day because you came to believe. All you have to do is believe that there is something out there that's bigger than you, that's willing to help you. This fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is bigger than any one of us. It's a giant society of people all in the same boat. All alcoholics and will always be alcoholics and we're here to help each other stay sober. Doesn't matter whether you have 40 days or 40 years, we're still here to help no matter what, you stay sober. And the youngest of us can help the older of us in any given day. It's a two-way street for sure. So we're here. And there's nothing to do with steps two except come to believe. Again, sitting in your chair in the living room, can you can come to believe. You just have to honestly look inside yourself and see if there's something inside of you that can allow you to come to believe in a power greater than yourselves. The next one, step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. So I've heard over the years a million times people say, yep, step three, I did that last night. I turned everything over to God. But that's not step three. Step three is you made a decision. Another thing that doesn't take any action. It gets you started down a path, but you haven't done any action yet. It's made a decision. You know, if you get up in the morning, you say, you know, I think I'll have a cup of coffee. That's a decision. There's no work in that. So step three, again, is this easy thing. And I hear people just fighting with it for so long but you're just making a decision 
and you'll learn what it means to turn your will and your lives over to the care of God as you understand them as you go along. And you can learn that quick and, and you'll get to a point where it does become work because you get to a point where you surrender and you finally give in. And then there's that surrender where you get on your knees and honestly ask God to help you in your life and your thoughts. Turn our will and our lives over to care of God. Well, our will is our thinking and our lives are our actions, what we do every day. Those things we do, those are, that's our, that's our life. And our will is what we think about doing and what, what actions those thoughts bring about. And if they're bringing about doing something that we probably shouldn't do, then we got to change our thinking. We've got to ask for help. And this power greater in ourselves, which here it says to the care of God, as we understand him means you can have any kind of God you want, big, little, whatever you want to believe in. You believe in that and ask that thing for help. And it will help you make decisions. It will help you have better thoughts and therefore better actions. And it's gradual. It's slow. It's not. Now, there is a fact that in that surrender, if you're 100% honest with yourself and totally open-minded and you're totally willing to let God help you, you can have a vast, great spiritual experience right then and there. And many people do in a step three surrender. It's the only ritual that's in AA is to surrender. And if you do that and you have that spiritual experience, it's gravy after that. It's a lot of work, but you, you know, you have the evidence inside yourself. If it doesn't happen that way, that's educational variety, a slow process of understanding what that God is and how that God helps you in your life, making up your mind, helping you make decisions, helping you in when you're doing things to do the next right thing, which is not really a hard thing to do. We'll work with step three for a little while. And that's in this particular chapter. And then we get to step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. It's an inventory. Grocery stores take inventory all the time. Stores take inventories all the time. There's inventories, inventories, in, all the time there's inventories. So taking an inventory, we just never did one of ourselves. So it seems rare, it seems hard. But this book guides you through it. It's not hard and it's a great relief when you do it. Step five, admit it to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. A simple conversation with God. Honest, open, and willing to be thorough, and there's great benefits from that. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Humbly, on our knees, a prayer, the seventh step prayer, ask God to help you. And in step six, willingness is the key there. Build up enough willingness to have God remove your shortcomings and very big changes will happen for you. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Again, willingness is needed there. Be willing to make amends for all the stuff you did over the years, how you hurt your family, how you hurt jobs, businesses, people, your friends, other family members. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. The hardest part about that one is realizing you're not part of the others. You've got to make the amends whether it hurts you or not, just nobody else. Ten, continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. A daily inventory, so you don't have the big inventory built up again. Eleven, a great step. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. 
So we don't have to know what God's will is. We pray for it in the mornings, and we meditate, and we let it come to us. And we'll know what God's will is after you tried it for a while. And we'll read a lot about that in the book, in the next chapter. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. Having had a spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. So, if you say, so why do I have to do the steps? Well, you have to do the steps because you want to have that spiritual awakening. When, you, when that spiritual awakening happens, as you go through these steps and you build that spiritual awakening and you start seeing things for what they really are, see yourself for who you really are, and see what you can do to help other people, then it makes it all worth it. So that spiritual awakening allows you to think and act the way you were always intended to act. Do you think God, like, okay, I'm going to make that guy an alcoholic, you know? Do you think God was punishing us by making us alcoholics? No, it was choices we made and a disease we have. But we can fix that, and God will give us the strength and the power to fix that and the knowledge to fix that. All we have to do is ask, and we've got to help others. So, so it says in the next couple of paragraphs, or next paragraph, Many of us exclaimed, what an order, I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us is able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. And the steps are the principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. So, nobody's grading you. There's no time limit. You can grow as fast or slow as you want to. You can grow in, grow in certain areas and not grow in other areas. That's fine. As long as you're growing and as long as you're not picking up a drink. The main thing is all these steps are to prevent us from picking up another drink because we have the disease of alcoholism and it will kill us. So, we're trying to stay alive. And we're trying to enjoy life as it was meant to be. And we can do it with the help of this book. And then it says, Our description of the alcoholic, which is Bill's story and uh, more about alcoholism and a little bit of uh, there is a solution. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, which is we agnostics, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. That's step one. That probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. No human power. Not the doctors, not the wife, not anybody. The ones that could help you is a power greater than yourself. No human power. And the last one, C, God could and would if he were sought. So, we're given this idea that we should be seeking God. Don't be afraid of God. Don't be hiding from God. Be out in the open and be seeking God and get build that relationship with a higher power and see how that goes. If it works, keep doing it. If it doesn't work, try harder. Talk to people in this room and you'll get better. Now, we'll stop there and next week, now that we've done that part, we're at step three. And we'll talk about step three and into step four next week. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll see you next week.